Welcome everybody that's joined us this afternoon. Um, this is uh, part of the ESIS series that we're putting on to support timely discharge. Um, I'm Wendy Reese. I work with the ESIS team and I'm the host today. This webinar is focusing on the relationship between primary and secondary care, uh, in particular around admission avoidance and also around discharge. And I'm with my colleague today, Mitten, who will introduce himself properly in a second. Um, just wanted to say we'll record this session and it will be available to you through our futures platform on YouTube and it'll be available tomorrow. We're going to uh, have a conversation today. We welcome your questions in the chat. Uh, Mitten and I are going to have a, a conversation about the relationship between primary and secondary care. I, I think I muted myself. Apologies, you might have missed some of that. Uh, where did I get to, Mitten? <laughs> I think you were going to introduce yourself and you were just setting the scene, Wendy. Lovely, lovely. So, yeah, hopefully, I'm Wendy Reese. Apologies, my uh, computer muted itself then. Um, so, we're going to have a discussion today, a conversation uh, around the relationship between primary and secondary care and how. Uh, primary care supports admission avoidance and also how primary care plays a really vital role in discharge of patients when, when they're in hospital. All your questions and comments are very welcome in the chat and I'll keep an eye on those. Uh, we will leave some time at the end for a wider discussion if that's helpful. But I'm going to hand over to my colleague now who will introduce himself. Thank you, Wendy, and, and apologies again for the slight technical thing. Um, first, I'm Mitin Gruprelli. I'm a local GP, or, or not so local to a uh, lot of you guys in sunny Northamptonshire in Corby. Uh, I've been in Corby for 15 odd years working as a GP partner and a trainer. Um, my interest in urgent care goes all the way back when I did my any shift in Leicester Oil Infirmary, and I carried that interest on. Um, through joining various, um, what I like to call, or what my colleagues like to call, the dark side management roles uh, with NHS England, uh, with my local CCG, uh, and I've been a clinical associate with uh, ECUS ever since it was established. Um, one of the biggest bugbear of mine, as always, has been this big gap in primary and secondary care, and how we look after our patients. So I'm looking forward to having a interesting probing uh, dialogue with Wendy and yourselves uh, to see how we can try and bridge some of that and generate some ideas. Um, back to you, Wendy. <laughs> oh, thank, thanks, Mitten. So I just wanted to start off by asking you, how have you and your colleagues been managing through COVID? What, what's that been like for you? Uh, yeah, thanks, Wendy. Thanks for asking that. And I think Rightly, firstly, a big thank you to all of us in the NHS who survived or still surviving these last two years. And I know it's been quite hard um, in trying to just stay afloat uh, with the already pressured system that we were under. Um, primary care, and I remember the dreaded um, day when we were thinking about the whole pandemic situation, uh, and suddenly we had to switch our model over to a complete remote model. Uh, which frankly wasn't a choice that GPs were asked to make. It was something that was uh, thrusted on us through NHS England Diktat. Um, and rightly at that point, we didn't know much about the virus. Now, all of this was in a backdrop of no different to the other sectors like community or mental health or secondary care in a very pressured environment. Um, for example, from 2015 to now in a recently published BMA article, um, We've already lost uh, 1,756 fully qualified GPs uh, in the last five years. And that's on a backdrop when we came, or when the pandemic hit us, with every practice having nearly 2,200 more patients. So the system, even before the pandemic came, was really hot uh, and we were struggling with capacity. Um, when it really hit us to change a model from a face-to-face -to, -face to a complete telephone only was dreaded. It was dreaded for most of us, but we adapted and adopted and supported our patients to the best we could. At no point did face-to-face -face stop. At no point have we stopped seeing patients. Uh, patients were triaged and then they were rightly 
if requiring either COVID positive or suspected COVID, they continue to be seen in general practice in primary care, either in hot hubs or in practices, depending on the estate solution they have. Um, I think I'm proud to say now that we are hopefully at some tail end, uh, the numbers that are emerging uh, through what's going on currently in primary care, in the backdrop of that big reduction in GP numbers, as I alluded earlier, we're now facing a situation where there's 4.9 million appointments more from 2019 to now in primary care, which for colleagues in acute hospital or community trust, where we're used to percentage increase in demand, I'm talking of 20% increase in demand currently in primary care, with two third of that uh, being face to face now. So we've got a pressured, heated system, pandemic, less GPs, much more demand. Um, so yeah, it's been tough, but I think um, it's equally been quite rewarding to see where we've all had a single common purpose of working in the first wave of COVID, looking after our patients between primary care, secondary care, social care, mental health. That common focus that we all had uh, really is thus it's been one of the most rewarding experience last two years of working in a much more integrated way. I'm sure there's a lot more work to be done moving forwards. Um, but yeah, that's just a snapshot of how life has been for the last two years. Oh, thanks, Mitin. Um, it's really helpful. If we just talk a little about admission avoidance. How um, how does primary care um, support patients to avoid admission? And, and what sort of support do you need from your secondary colleagues to enable this? Yeah. Um, thank you, Wendy. And I think uh, to some extent, I hate that word admission avoidance, and I'll tell you why. It's about appropriate admissions in the appropriate sectors. Um, so the whole job and remit um, of why some of us join general practice is to look after our patients from birth to death uh, and to be able and to do that in such a way that we can keep them safely in the community. Uh, as long as physically possible. Um, now, what we tend to do, we have limited tools uh, for colleagues who have not worked in primary care in terms of how we can do that. For example, the biggest tool I have in my practice is what the patient tells me, the history, and a few set of tools, my stethoscope and a simple otoscope. I haven't got access to the broad range of diagnostic that colleagues in, in secondary care will have. Um, However, I think that long standing relationship and knowing the patient allows us to probably manage and take some of the risk much more appropriately. I think what we do need from our colleagues in both community and secondary care is that timely advice, that timely support and that timely way of us as senior decision makers taking a calculated risk for our patients such that we can safely manage them in the community. Uh, Sometimes that can be in form of a quick advice and guidance on a telephone. Sometimes that can be getting early access to outpatient clinics. And other times it could be a quick investigation or diagnostic that could be readily available on the day, uh, such that we can have a joint plan to try and manage that patient safely in the community. Now that's really interesting, isn't it? And, and would you say that you share the risk across secondary and primary care in those cases or how does that work sort of clinically and medically? I think it, that would be the ideal situation um, and that would be I think perhaps uh, something that we need to all be ambitious and working towards um, and I appreciate the pressures that I alluded in primary care are no different in community mental health or secondary care and sometimes trying to get hold of that timely advice from a busy registrar on the ward or a senior matron who's trying to do the best she can taking admissions or even from my district nursing colleagues in the community is not that easily available. And in that case, then it does default to trying to use that one door that is open uh, either through SDEC if that's locally available or through a &E. And then the risk transfer takes place at that point uh, and I feel sometimes without proper clinical handover, um, so admission would be much better from a GP into secondary care if a dialogue has taken place with someone uh, and we can transfer the risk and vice versa 
but that doesn't happen all the time. And sometimes the patient, as we all know, lands up repeating the story five times uh, to five different people from primary care. So I think there's a lot more work to be done. Um, there are some tools uh, and we can cover that later on around Consultant Connect, um, certain virtual things that um, are available in certain systems, which allow that time, you know, that timely clinical handoff to take place or is taking, um, but it doesn't happen all the time. Yeah, so you've sort of touched on that already. It, it, do you find it, it's not easy then to admit a patient into a specialty team, even if maybe you've had a conversation, you still find it difficult to admit straight to them? Is that the case? Uh, I, I think and this is something which I tell my registrars uh, who sometimes have had no um, working in primary care, for example, because not everyone rotates through general practice. And when they come in first time in their clinical post in GP land after doing some stints in acute medicine or a &E. It's quite interesting the feedback they give because um, they're like Dr. Uprelia, sometimes we hear that, you know, patients have been sent to hospital by the GP. Why have they not done X, Y and Z? But when we are trying to admit a patient from general practice, it's a long time consuming affair. In all honesty, for me and my patient, it would be much better if I could manage the patient, put a plan in place and see them in primary care, trying to get hold of a busy uh, secondary care team, to try and get hold of our district nursing team or community team takes a lot more time than trying to manage a patient simplistically in general practice. Speciality admissions um, locally, we're not lucky. I think I'd be lucky if actually Sometimes I can get patients directly to the medical assessment unit or the medical SDEC um, because sometimes they are bedded, which then defaults all the patients through a &E, which then again puts more pressure back to the a &E team and the primary care team. Um, so it can be really tricky actually and quite difficult to make an admission from primary care rather than it being something sometimes I see, you know, let's, they've sent it because um, they just wanted to send it. Uh, Actually, it takes a lot more time, effort and energy to try and do that. So um, we may as well have a little conversation about Consultant Connect because it's quite relevant. What's your experience with that sort of um, system? Um, so I think it's a, a, for those colleagues who don't know, Consultant Connect is a, a tool. I, I personally have no shares in it and I don't think ECIST has any shares in it, but it's one of many tools that allows a con conversation to take place, either using an app, uh, or from your smartphone or a generic phone number that systems have got that allows you to connect directly for as a GP or colleagues working in primary care, my AMPs and AHP teams to speak to a consultant who's got protected time in certain systems to be able to take these calls. And what it does is it removes that whole bleep waiting to speak to someone, getting tired of holding, um, and then you can have a senior decision maker dialogue between the GP and the consultant to say, I've got X, Y and Z. This is where I've got to in primary care with my patient. I'm wondering if this patient needs an admission or do we can we do something else in the community? And then a joint plan is put in place that gets recorded uh, in a, as far as I understand the technology in an encrypted way and it links to the NHS number of the patient because the GP feeds that in um, mm -hmm. and such a way that a letter is generated that comes to primary care. For example, if the decision was to do X, Y and Z um, or it would mean that, yes, I think the admission is the only thing to do. No, I am then send it. I'll let my junior team or the bed management team know. But what it does is it allows that old school concept of human to human dialogue and two senior decision makers making a clinical risk judgment based on the information they hold so that it can benefit patient care. Um, I think there are they are developing as they're going along for certain specialities where you can even upload pictures. So things like dermatology, uh, other things, and that allows again a quick view uh, of the consultant calling being able to see what they're dealing with and give a timely advice. So I think quite a useful tool. Um, and really handy uh, to allow that clinical risk transfer and dialogue to safely look after the patient. 
And actually, Gordon's put a question uh, in the chat box around the summary care record and whether that's sort of used in your experience. Is that used by secondary care? Um, and, and is the information obviously from your practice available through the summary care record? Oh, oh, thank you, Gordon. I think um, the whole digital revolution and I think uh, data transfer and having one patient, one record. I, I think I've been a GP for 20 years. And it's been one of those key things which we've been talking about. I hope and pray uh, we get there someday, at least before I retire. I think the SCR depends on the quality of information, like most things that are being shared and transferred, uh, both from primary care and what's being uploaded. And it then depends on the timely access of a &E teams and hospital teams even being aware that this exists for them to use and utilize. Because sometimes you'd be surprised it sits there somewhere in ED. And I've seen this in some um, site visits that I've done with eKist where there's even system one available. And there are colleagues who are saying, what is that? How do I access that? Uh, equally, I think with the junior teams rotating at four monthly uh, notices, sometimes they are not aware of that existing. So yes, really handy. It gives you a good snapshot of the conditions or the major conditions the patient's got the medications the patients have got, and then some allergies and other important information that might allow secondary care colleagues to make timely decision. Um, in fact, now with the NHS England app or NHS app, which people have, we need to really tap on that, if I'm being honest with you, because we're using that for the COVID vaccination bit. The pickup rate is really high, and actually that holds a lot more information than the summary care record would hold. Um, so absolutely, I think that the whole risk taking behavior and risk transfer becomes a lot easier with the correct information digitally that is available to colleagues in secondary care to support uh, them managing some of that risk uh, better in when they are in ED or MAU or wherever else they're based. Yes, I, when I was working in Worthing, which was up to about four years ago, we managed to get it as just a routine that any patient coming into majors would have their summary care record printed off by the reception team. Um, but at that stage, it was probably only complete for about 20% of patients and mainly just the medications. But I understand it's now much more complete for about 80% of the patients. Mm -hmm. And for a receiving team to have that medical history and the current medications is so valuable in accelerating care. In Scotland, we have something similar called the emergency care summary. Um, but, and that's very complete amongst our patients in open and helps us to prepare for arrival for patients. Um, unfortunately, we can't see them across the country borders, although I'm hoping that that will improve. And I agree the NHS app uh, with the patient holding that information. So the, the very rich information that's held on the GP systems is, is available in hospitals because our um, secondary care systems are sel seldom anywhere near as good as the GP systems and the information held in them. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Gordon. That's a really interesting point. Um, just wanted to go back to talk before we talk about discharge, just to talk about what urgent and emergency care looks like in primary care. What, what's the day in the life of UEC for, for GPs, Mitten? Oh, thank you, Wendy. Um, and I think, yes, sometimes um, we forget, I even mean, I forget doing e control when we're doing a site visit in AD, we forget that. Frankly, 80-90% um, of NHS total UEC activity is happening actually in primary care. And when I say primary care, I mean dentistry, pharmacy, GP. So a large proportion of all what goes on on a day-to-day -day basis in our NHS uh, happens in those sectors. Uh, I think a typical day, Wendy, depends on the practice uh, and pra different practices have different models. But if I could speak for the majority that I'm aware of and I've worked in, uh, most practices have reverted to a same day model. Uh, I mean, I say that it's patients having much more capacity on the given day to be able to make an appointment on that same day to see their GP. Some of that uh, you could argue has made the phones completely busted because we've got suddenly an old telephony system with thousands of people ringing in to try and get into um, and get an appointment. Um, Typically, the reception team would triage some of those uh, in terms of which the best uh, person within general practice is. Some of them would be signposted rightly to community pharmacy, hopefully, and others would get booked in into our general practice appointment screen. Um, 
most practices will have a routine running service. And when I mean routine, what I mean is the long term condition management, advanced care planning, palliative care planning, and some of those appointments are booked uh, with the GPs. And then you will usually have a, a same day team who are looking after the same day appointments. Um, typically total patient contacts again based on some of the numbers uh, that have been shared and when i say contacts i don't just mean physically seeing patients i mean dealing with numerous other things that you have to in primary care would be anywhere in the range of 50 to 60 for a single gp um, my typical day starts at seven o'clock because i'd like to get early so that i've got some time to do the administrative work with first patients walking into the surgery at eight o'clock and then I would be lucky if I'm walking out of the surgery uh, by 7 p.m. in the evening and then usually most GPs would log on to get on top of their administrative duties in the evening either from their home or on the weekend to cleanse that up. Anything can walk just like a &E. I don't know what the next patient's going to be. You could have a two-year-old toddler who's coming with a runny nose to a 50-year-old gentleman who's having an MI. Uh, you could have an 80 year old elderly patient coming to say thank you to you and booked it to say it was a headache uh, because she just wanted to speak to you to an 80 year old who's having a sudden stroke in front of you. So anything comes, anything walks, anything happens. Um, we try and manage the best we can within the limited tools and structure we have. Um, and actually the conversion rate from practices, if we use the A&E language or if we use our ambulance language, is pretty low. Um, I'm hopeful we can capture somewhere that data and, and share that. But just a snapshot, um, if I could share from my practice alone, um, probably in a week, uh, we'll be seeing roughly about anywhere between 1,200 to 1,500 patients a week. Um, or for a population of 14,000 on my list um, and maybe would be having roughly about 50 to 60 admissions. So we're managing the rest of them pretty much with primary care with the tools that we have. Um, but yeah, it can be quite a, a challenging day in between the morning and the afternoon clinic. Typically, there is the urgent and emergency care aspect of home visiting, which we still exist uh, in this country. And we would have some support from paramedics if they are working in a PCN or the GPs would go out along with the community team to help manage those patients safely. So your housebound palliative patients. You would also have the care homes and nursing home, which I think we'll pick up a bit separately later on that you need to look after. So a lot of UEC work takes place in primary care um, with quite limited tools. Uh, it's quite exciting actually. Uh, a good successful day is where you feel like you've, you've added value to your patient. Uh, I'm sure for most of us as clinicians. Oh, thanks, Mitten. And um, what's, what other sort of ways do you support patients, you know, using sort of the MDT and virtual wards? Your, what's your experience of, of managing patients a little bit longer than just that day sort of to support them out of hospital? Yeah, um, I think there's numerous ways in different parts of the country people have set up their MDTs. If I could take it into two chunks, if that would be useful. One chunk would be the housebound, people living in their own houses, severe frailty or moderate to severe frailty patients. The second chunk would be around your patients who are in your residential nursing homes or facilities where they are not staying in their own homes, if you like, but it is their home in terms of the how length of period they're going to stay there. There's an MDT that usually systems will organize around frailty and every system has a different um, frailty pathway and our, some systems unfortunately don't have it, which would be a, a, either a virtual or a, a when I say virtual, the kind of virtual platform we're talking on right now or even sometimes just a, a clinical virtual where they're put up on your list and you're doing a virtual ward round along with the district nursing team. We would discuss typically patients that uh, our community teams are worried about or our palliative care team are worried about or patients that have been discharged from the hospital with palliative needs. And we would typically come up with a care plan to say what is the best thing to do for this patient for the next week, couple of weeks or years, depending on where the patient is on their clinical needs and journey. So that would be a, a, an MDT that's well attended. It's usually attended by 
GPs, practice nurses, uh, registrars if it's a training practice, and then the community team. But again, like I said, it can vary from different parts of the countries depending on what's been commissioned to primary care. Then there's the whole care home, nursing home, um, residential home um, bit, which probably has been standardized a bit for practices who are part of the primary care networks or PCNs, as we call them, which are groupings of different practices which have come together to look after a population based approach of whichever care homes they fall under. There would be a typically a virtual or sometimes even a physical face to face ward round that, that takes place where the GPs actually take touch base with the care home manager, the people who are working with them, so some of the carers or the nurses, and they review the patients that they might have on their caseload. Again, to put some proactive care plans in place. I think back to the point that probably Gordon raised earlier. Um, I think the bit which I think is missing from both those bit is that information sharing and transfer such that those plans are readily available for our colleagues in secondary care or community care and actually our ambulance services as well, because sometimes that could be the key information on those discussions could be something that could help uh, to put appropriate admissions in place rather than being taken in. So lots of activity that takes place around care planning. There's a whole host of things that takes place around the children. So safeguarding meetings. There's all sorts of things that we need to make sure that we're doing care plans such that we're not leading to any um, inappropriate, um, you know, attendances. Uh, and if there are any inappropriate attendances, those are flagged in a timely way to primary care colleagues. So yeah, the afternoon is quite exciting part of the day as well, which is full of these MDT meetings, discussions, um, whilst the morning and the afternoon surgeries um, are either stopping and the other one starting. Actually, that um, Andrew's asked a question about how does the hospital get in touch with people like community matrons or community pharmacists? Is this done through the MDT meeting, Mitten, or, or is there separate ways to do that? What, what's your experience? So I think I'll answer it in two ways, Andrew. So I think there, there would be, it depends on who's contacting them. And again, varies um, from um, each system to system. Um, and I think I was joking with Wendy um, about this earlier with her background uh, in community nursing. Uh, I wish there was that good old days where I had number for people like Wendy, where I used to just ring them and, and she had my number when she needed me. But I know life is busy and things have moved on. Uh, but those days unfortunately are gone. Uh, there would be usually or typically a single point of access uh, in some systems where there's a generic number through which you can contact uh, colleagues. Um, unfortunately, some of it we try and simplify but complicate. So locally, it sometimes can take me 30 minutes to get through the single point of access. So it can be really frustrating. Uh, and I can appreciate sometimes if hospital colleagues have the access to that as well, they might struggle. But there are some systems who have developed just like what we were discussing the consultant connect. You could have tools which are similar to that where primary care colleagues can get hold of community matrons or district nursing colleagues through those kind of tools and our secondary care colleagues could utilize that similar set of number as well. Um, in terms of community pharmacy and general practice, because I think I always get told uh, by my consultant friends or you know nursing friends who work in secondary care or community teams that it's so hard to get through the practice within. All practices have a bypass numbers and in our system we've shared all our bypass numbers with all our hospital colleagues and consultants and with the wards and with the AD, such that they can bypass that and they don't have to wait uh, for a long period and then they can have access or speak to uh, the on-call GP if they require. Uh, so there are various ways of accessing those different, but unfortunately they vary system to system. And it sort of links in a little bit that, to Gordon's next question. We were going to talk about discharge process. So, so how easy is it for you to know that a patient has been discharged from hospital? Um, really good question, Wendy. Um, and apologies if some systems have cracked this, then please get in touch with me and I'm, I'd, I'd love to um, hear more. Um, if I if I just give, if I take it a step back, if that's useful just to explain to colleagues how we get informed of a, a discharge. Uh, typically, uh, 
what would happen is we would have lots of letters that are coming from consultant colleagues, secondary care colleagues, community colleagues, dietitians, private insurance report, shotgun licenses, code exemption. On an average, I could have anything between two to 300 letters coming into my inbox in terms of into the practice for a practice of 14,000 list size. In that would be buried that discharge letter of a patient uh, that has come. Because sometimes you wouldn't even know that the patient has been admitted because it's gone via, you know, an I-99 call, the patient's family's taken them, and it wouldn't really flag on our system if they were in the hospital. Um, the discharge letter would then follow, would get scanned on. The scanning team would be usually an administrative function, and then that gets distributed to various GPs, and that's that. Uh, 6.30 to 8 o'clock in the evening, I'm scavenging through those letters and bloods that have dropped in my inbox. Um, so it's a long winded process. Some systems do have an electronic discharge letter that drops directly into our inbox. But again, um, I wouldn't know because there would be another 100 odd sitting there which would be outpatient letters as to which one is there. 111 colleagues send us letters as well. Um, so sometimes it could be almost a week or even two weeks, depending on every practice's system, that you'll find out a patient has been discharged. So yeah, it, it's not as easy as it just lands up in front of us like a summary care record, as Gordon was saying earlier. So how um, how could it work better? What what would be your your sort of advice to people listening today? Um, in my mind, I think, and again. Um, we need to create capacity. There's a lot of wastage that we've got and inefficiency in both primary and secondary care that needs to be firstly eroded to create some capacity for what I'm going to suggest. Because if I suggest something, which I will in a second, um, I'll have my GP colleagues pointing guns at me. Um, so let me give you an example. If I get a letter where I've been told, uh, please repeat use and ease in two weeks time, when the letter actually has reached me in two weeks time, as I said earlier, when quite easily we could have amongst us and if both teams have the capacity, had given the form to the patient to have that use and ease done in two weeks time. Firstly, that would lead to hopefully the patient getting a timely blood test. The blood test being timely actioned by our colleagues who have ordered that such that there's safety maintained in there because I don't have sight of some of the previous use and ease, for example, that the patient might have in the hospital. And what that would do is it would release some of the time and capacity for me in primary care for me to almost take that clinical handover back into the community for some of these really complex patients. Equally, things like virtual ward rounds and some of those MDTs we were discussing would be a safe place where some of these patients could be put on a virtual ward round and it allows the primary care team to attend some of those ward rounds. And then there's a dialogue that takes place between primary and secondary care to say, look, this is a risk transfer now where we've discharged the patient with this plan. We're hoping with this plan that the patient's situation will improve. If it doesn't improve, the next steps we need to take are X, Y, and Z rather than admission. And it would be much, much easier for us than to manage that patient safely in the community. So, I think the timely discharge notification and improving that process is one way of improving it. Secondly, making sure that the work we generate in secondary care for maintaining that risk transfer is completed in secondary care, uh, such that there's some time released in primary care colleagues to attend some of these virtual ward round meetings in a much more timely way. And then we could have a joined up risk, you know, transfer or risk maintenance of the patient in the community. Uh, currently, there are pockets of that, but I don't think I've seen a system that's completely cracked it. Uh, and I wish there is one, then that'll be great. We could all learn from that. Um, but yeah, I'm sure we're going to cover some virtual water rounds in some of our other webinars coming next week. So I think my colleagues who do that are much better worse to it than I am. But yeah, that would be one suggestion. The other bit would be involving and including for example, sometimes in my discharge letter, I will get, um, and I, I hope I don't get shot for saying this, I get community house officer orders. GP to arrange use, use and ease in two weeks. GP to refer to cardiology. 
GP to refer to gastroenterology, GP to review rash. And all of that, frankly, creates extra work and time and capacity in primary care when actually it would have been a lot better for that to have taken place whilst they were in secondary care. And what I mean by that is not a gastroenterologist coming and seeing the patient, but that outpatient bit happening there, the cardiology bit happening there, or whatever was needed, rather than more administrative burden. And sometimes patients get lost to follow up in terms of, you know, the GP is not noticing it or, and that just causes more significant events. So, so yeah, this creating that efficiency and time for us to do that risk transfer would be one suggestion that I would suggest. So, so you're suggesting that an outpatient appointment is made in secondary care for a patient to go back rather than coming to you to make the outpatient appointment for something you haven't seen. OK, that makes sense. Andrew. Afternoon. Oh, afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mitten and Wendy. It's a great conversation. I, I, I can't not come in on this, Mitten. Um, so. <laughs> The, the, the challenge is, is is that we're both caught up in a, in a system that's still fit for purpose, right? I mean, the 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 eighteen week process applies to a GP referral into secondary care, but not a secondary to secondary care referral. So if I make a referral for a patient into a cardiology clinic, there's no obligation for that patient to be seen within eighteen weeks. They're not tracked that you know, they could be equally lost in the ether um, and similar for the two week wait stuff. So the, the two week wait referral pathway for suspected cancer. So for example, I'm a gastroenterologist and the upper GI pickup rate for a two week wait cancer referral on that pathway is less than 3%. So 97% of patients going through that pathway, certainly locally, don't have upper GI cancer. But so most of our cancers are sitting on the 18 week pathway. Um, and I guess it's just a comment about some of the handoffs are totally totally unsatisfactory but almost totally inevitable because of the the, the restrictions and and the, the the way the service has been poorly designed uh, i don't know what you how you feel about that um, yeah thanks Andrew. i think um, for my sins i was a ccg gp early gp for a long period of time when we were used to what i used to call bean counting uh, and tariff and uh, uh, all the rest of that things that came along with that, including the 18 week bit. I think we have a prime opportunity through ICS uh, and that different way of working to break some of those cycles because as you said, it's completely inefficient for and he, rightly secondary care colleagues are one having to do that because they care about their patient, but all we're landing up doing is and I'll give you a simple example of that gastro path, Andrew would be the patient would immediately rightly or the relative pick up the phone and ring the GP to say you need to do this referral. And actually that would then lead to another appointment and that would then lead to another paperwork trail out of those 350 already done. And the outcome for the patient hasn't improved. But what we've done is we've made, we've taken some efficiency out of primary care by bombarding the system with that. When we could release some of that, to support some of those timely discharge. And I think that's the plea that I, I'm trying to make here. And I appreciate, you know, I've, I've uh, uh, or I've seen consultant colleagues raise exactly the points that you're saying, Andrew. But I don't think that's something systems now with the opportunities they have, they can crack on with it and they have an opportunity to crack on with it. Um, and some of it with, let's say, fixed contracts or bulk contracts or whatever else they're going to call it. Um, and with the whole elective care um, rejiggling piece that we're all going to have to do with the backlog. If we don't do it now, we'll never do it. Uh, Thank you. So I think what I'm hearing is that there is a there is a bit of an issue, but there is an opportunity in terms of streamlining the way that we refer patients to specialist pathways or um, you know, for, from secondary and primary care. So I think that's a really interesting. We might not better solve it today, but if we know there's an issue, then we can start addressing that. So that's really helpful. Um, just on a slightly different um, subject, Robert has asked around, do you have a directory of services for communities that you sort of keep up to date or where do you gather the information you need for your patients around services? Uh, very, very good question. Um, and, and, and 
I wish I could find that single directory of service that's completely up to date, uh, which includes voluntary sector and all the rest of the excellent work that people do in community and it keeps changing by the day, depending on, on what happens and the teams keep getting renamed. So we do have a MyDOS in our local patch, which um, they try and keep it as up to date as possible. Um, and I think now they've developed a local app which allows you to be able to access it on your phone, which is joined up to all our hips in this modern life. Um, but yeah, I think it, it isn't something that I know is widely available up and down the country, and it's critical. Uh, and what you land up doing uh, usually is you tend to default to the one that you know the most and you have the number for rather than the one that's probably the most appropriate for the patient and is readily available with a shorter waiting list. So I think yes is the answer locally, um, but no is the answer nationally, if I'm being honest with you. And one of the things that, you know, this has always just been a challenge since I started my community nursing, is that when you meet as an MDT, I did find that when you put, bring everybody together, you've got that collective knowledge, you're talking about uh, a patient, and the ideas will come from the people in the room. Some of them will be delivering those pathways and some of them will know the people that are. So actually, because GP practices now routinely do come together, don't they, weekly to do a whiteboard or a virtual ward type meeting for the most complex or, or at risk patients, they will get the, the opportunity to, to be sort of supported by the people across uh, the community as required. So I think that is helpful. But I do appreciate. I guess 111 is probably the place where things are maintained as, as best as possible. And there are, of course, always clinical hubs in 111 if you're ever stuck for a, an urgent need for a patient. And most people should be able to contact their clinical hub direct if they're working in the community. Um, so thank you so much. I'm going to um, open up for any questions if anybody wants to put their hand up. No, I think is there anything we haven't covered? Is there anything that anybody wanted to know a little bit more about or have we have we covered the things that you were expecting? Andrew. Well, you know me, I, I find uh, silence deeply <laughs> <do>. uncomfortable, <laughs> so um, I, I had to come in. Um, look, uh, Mitt and Wendy, it, it's, it's been a great conversation, a real privilege to sit in on that. And, and from a hospital uh, practitioner perspective, it's always really helpful to, to see and hear the other side of things. Mitt and we, we I, to me, it seems like there's still a lot of variation out in the community in different systems, just as there are in hospital. This is not, you know, this is just, a, you know, while we talk about a lot of these um, system things on, on these calls actually we acknowledge that every system is subtly uh, or not even subtly sometimes different are there any top tips that you have if, if you know we've got clinical leaders operational leaders on the call any top tips on who they should approach how they start uh, who they should go to to start these conversations yeah about improving or reducing variation or introducing a, a dos those kind of things who do they go and tap up yeah, re really good question, um, Andrew. And I think um, having been um, not so long ago, I just gave up my clinical leader of ICS role last month because I just needed to come back on the front line. Uh, and I thought that that was probably a needed and required. I think there's, there's, there's the place to start. Most places would have now some form of a clinical Senate that are being established. Um, and up and down the country with ICS, um, that's going to become more and more required. It was really positive at last to see um, that in the national document of creating ICS, clinical and professional leadership is one of the most required criteria uh, for an ICS to become an ICS. So some of the roles and individuals will unfortunately or fortunately would change, which will mean that clinical leads in the system will have much more system based roles. So, for example, in the old days, if you needed to do your MIDOS, um, you would take some of this to your a &E delivery board or your colleagues sitting in LMC in primary care would be the person you'd contact. If you were sitting in uh, 
community care as a community matron or district nurse or a consultant, then it would be through your co or your chief operating officer who sits on those boards. And if you were sitting, I guess, in your hospital setting, it would be through your clinical directors in those specialties who could take those to those key forums. Um, I think the any delivery boards that still exist are, are composed of uh, senior clinical leaders, chief operating officers, chief exec, and in some really good places, um, voluntary sector communities, health and mental health. So those are the places where you could probably escalate and take to uh, would be the point. Um, the other bit, and that's quite interesting, Wendy raising the 111 bit, because there is a wealth of, there's a DOS there, which every system has, but how do we make that, that directory of services readily accessible? Uh, so probably speaking to the 111 leads such that, that that can be available and accessed by others would be another good place to probably start. Uh, and I think um, most trust or most primary care colleagues will, through their practice managers uh, will be able to access who those key people are. Yeah, and and I just wanted to add probably that one of the most um, helpful ways of getting information passed from hospitals to GPs is through the patient. And uh, most patients are, are really sort of invested in their recovery. And if you give them the information and as say Mitten said around the forms, you say we need you to make an appointment, we need you to have a blood test. If you give them all the information rather than it being in a letter somewhere that they never see, they can see everything that's needed. They'll drive that. Most patients will drive that and make sure they get what, what what's needed. And obviously, if if the patient themselves doesn't feel able to do that, then then a family member or, or a neighbour or someone like that. And I've always found in the community best to ask the patient what would work for you. You know, what information do you need? If I write this down, would that be helpful? Uh, and they, they will honestly take control um, of the next steps. So so that would be my advice on that. Um, is it Arvind? Hi. Hi, Wendy. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, fantastic discussions. Mitten, thank you so much. You've given us a lot of uh, useful information for us to think about. Um, from your perspective, how easy is it for you to access the range of community services? Yeah, you know, I know we talked about DOS. You know, that's that's been uh, my bugbear for a long, long time because they keep changing every so often. Yes. But even if you find one, uh, the referral process seems to be a lot more archaic and therefore more cumbersome and time consuming. Uh, it's much easier to refer to a specialist services these days because you quickly dictate something and it off it goes and we know it is secure, it will happen. Whereas uh, for community services, I find that unless you do specific tasks, it never happens and also quite difficult to track why it did not happen. Uh, so the governance process around that is not as well developed as my feeling. I could be wrong. But I thought I'd like to know your views on that. Yeah, uh, yeah, really good question, Arvind. And I think, uh, again, an apology is to sound like a broken record, uh, but that's the honest truth. Because as we know, in our lovely country, every community is disparate and every community is a living country and organization by itself. And unfortunately, the community services respond to that. So I think, firstly, at least being aware of the list of things that are there is a good starting point. Secondly, to top that, each of them will have a different process, as we said, uh, to refer into. Some will take self referrals, which I love it, and I'm sure every clinician will love it because who better to ask the service what their needs are rather than me filling some 10 page form. Uh, so I think those services will do really well who take self referrals in my mind. I think standardization, I think back to uh, the point we were talking around that access to that patient record. If now the patients will have that autonomy of having their records on their phone, I personally, I don't see a reason why we should be sitting around writing 20 page letters if that's now readily accessible. But that would be a, a lovely world to live in. Single point of access uh, as has been put in place for community and mental health services in certain patches. It's great if the wait time is below five minutes for a clinician to answer. I would say three minutes if I'm being honest with you in our busy lives, but I appreciate that's not doable because if you make it 30 minutes, 
We all know as clinicians we are busy. We'll find a way around and we will default to what is easiest for us and our patient. And I think that's where we land up sometimes bombarding some of those self referral services because we wanted to keep it easy for our patients to get timely access. So I think sometimes certain um, uh, systems or services uh, think they're trying to be helpful by adding all these things, but frankly, it doesn't make it terribly helpful for the service user and for the service consumer, which is usually the GP. Uh, so yeah, there isn't a right or wrong answer. In our local patch, we thankfully our community mental health team and our community services are all on system one. Eighty percent of our practices are on system one. That allows um, some quick. They don't need much information. But has it solved the problem of filling a ten-page form, Arvind? No, it hasn't. So, it, the clinical having one clinical system still doesn't solve it. Uh, so, apologies, don't have an answer, but completely <laughs> agree with you. Well, um, in a strange way, it's good to see that you also share the same. <laughs> I I think um, you know, and as a community nurse, I'd much rather get a referral from the patient or their family. As you say, it's one conversation because when we receive the referral from you, we then contact the patient and the family. So we have the conversation twice and it doesn't seem to make much sense. But I appreciate there needs to be um, Im improvement in, in many of the pathways across our services. Uh, we're, we're coming up to our last five minutes. So while anybody's thinking of a last question for, for Mitten, just to let you know, we're going to post a very short uh, feedback questionnaire into the chat in a second. Chris will do that. It takes a couple of minutes. It's really helpful for us because we're running a number of these uh, events for um, for anybody across the country and it's really helpful for us to know where we've got the right subjects and, and, and the right sort of tone for you and, and we can obviously alter things as we go along. On Friday at midday we've got um, a fabulous webinar on same day emergency care and uh, virtual wards so we'll go into a little bit more detail around uh, what, what that model could look like um, and that will include obviously the hospital at home as also as the community virtual ward. So hopefully that'll be great. So is there anything else that anybody wanted to raise with us today? So thank you so much for listening to Mitten and I. We've really enjoyed um, talking to you. And Mitten, thank you very much for your time. No, thank you so much, guys. And thank you. Thank for you. Everyone's doing.